Tonight, I'm going to uh, start, and I think it's going to probably take me three Sunday nights to do this, but uh, I'm not sure. So I want to remind you, next Sunday morning, we're going to have a box down front, a sealed box with a little slot, and we're going to have some three-by-five cards. And uh, I think it would be interesting that when I get through of John 17, I'm going to take a few Sunday nights to answer these questions. And you can put anything you want to on there. I don't do stock market questions or, you know. But anything about the Bible, um, I would be happy to deal with. And we'll just take as many times as it does for me to move through those questions. And I do not want you to sign your name. The whole point is that you ask the questions you really want to ask without being concerned about who, who will think badly of me or this one I don't know. But I want you to ask whatever you want to. I have found that with college students, this really gets to some nitty-gritty questions really quick. Matter of fact, I, when I'm with them, I call it scratch where you itch. And um, so we'll have that box down here in the cards next Sunday morning. And we'll probably have it here a couple of weeks. And then I'll do that starting whatever Sunday night I get through at 17. Uh, this is the longest prayer of Jesus recorded anywhere in the New Testament. Um, this is the prayer... Where first he prays for himself. That's going to be one through five. That's what I'm going to deal with tonight. Then he's going to pray for his disciples who were with him in that upper room. Now, you know, it's a real possibility we saw at, at the end of 14, it says, and they went out. This may have occurred walking through Jerusalem, heading toward uh, the Mount of Olives. This may have occurred as they went up the Mount of Olives. I'm, I'm not sure exactly where, where Jesus gave these words. Uh, but this must have been a really encouraging prayer for those, um, those few men in that upper room who have been told he's leaving. And they just fall apart with these questions. So Jesus takes this time. He prays for himself. He prays for them. And then beginning in verse 20 through 26, he prays for us. He prays for all future believers. Now, here's, here's a little kicker, I think. He says, I pray for those who never have seen me and heard me. That's us. We have only seen him and heard him by faith. We've only seen him and heard him through scripture. And, um, boy, isn't it nice to be prayed for by Jesus? Because we live far more by faith than we do by sight. I mean, if Jesus knocked me down the road to Damascus, I think I'd live a pretty dedicated life. <laughs> Uh, you know, these men walked and saw and heard and experienced. And you and I, though we do have a faith experience, thank God, it's still a faith experience. We live and move and have our being in Him, and it's a faith experience. Now, the problem is that we can't prove that in a scientific world. And some people want that, and it's not available. It's not available. The other thing I want to say, and I hope this surprises you because it really surprised me when I thought about it. How many times has the Holy Spirit been mentioned in chapter 14 and 16? I mean, this, these are the two chapters on the person of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that right? Now, the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, that's another text. But what does the Spirit do? That's in these texts. Did you know the Holy Spirit is not mentioned once in chapter 17? Now, I don't quite understand that. But um, it's interesting to know that. It's interesting to, to realize that. Um, and I want to I say to you again, this is, this is hard for us. You realize that this was written some 40 years plus after John experienced this event. This is happening somewhere in the early 30s. He didn't write this. Until the middle 90s. Now, I, I believe the Holy Spirit brought to his mind the thing that Jesus has said. But he is going back and trying to, to give to us a summary of the words of Jesus and maybe even a summary of the prayer. This is not the, I don't, I, this is painful, but this is not the verbatim words of Jesus. This is the inspired memory of the Apostle John. And every now and there, the Lord, the John puts his little comment in there. Uh, that's obviously, can't, the, the comment can't be from Jesus because it's going to be about Jesus. So John is sharing with us what it was like in that upper room decades earlier. Um, 
It has always amazed me that I believe the Bible is the Word of God, but it is such a small part of the Word of God. How much more did Jesus say? How much more did Jesus do? How much more did Jesus pray? And at first we say to ourselves, oh, if I just had a videotape of Jesus, if I just had more of his sermons, if I just had more of his miracles, if I just knew exactly what he said in the upper room. Now, brothers and sisters, we don't need that. Think with me. Think with me. We do not need that. Everything we need for faith and life is in what we have. We don't need more information. Everything we need, we have. Now that means that what was selected, and this is what you've got to ask yourself over and over when interpreting the Gospels. Why, of all the things Jesus said and did, why record this? What does this say about God? What does this say about Jesus? What does this say about his disciples? Now, these are the questions we have to ask because we only have a selected amount of the words of Jesus, which for us are the words of God for sure. But it's only a small bit. Now, we don't need more information. We need more of him. Amen? And we get that by faith and not, and not simply by more information. I'm, I'm just going to do verses 1 through 5 tonight, and uh, I don't know how, quite how long that will take me, but I'm going to try to chase a few theological rabbits, and uh, if we have time, I'll, I'll certainly uh, dialogue with you some. I hope you open your Bibles, or if you have my notes, this is the first paragraph, where Jesus prays to the Father for himself. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes, I remember <laughs> years ago, I was the, my real first interim, I think, was at First Baptist Tyler. Now, First Baptist Tyler is the wealthy church in Tyler. There are chandeliers that cost more than my house in this church. And uh, this was a traditional Baptist church. And there were some people who had joined who wanted to clap <laughs> after the baptisms. Yeah, they wanted to clap after the music. They wanted to raise their hand. We had to call 911. You, you would have think that, that there was some great sin in this church for raising their hands. And I remember trying to talk to them about this. And I, I want to talk to you. When I grew up, when I was growing up, you know, Baptists just didn't talk about the Holy Spirit. We just didn't do it. We, we just didn't do it. And, and kind of the way it was said is, if, if you raise two hands, you're a charismatic. If you only raise one, you're a Nazarene. That's how you tell the difference between a charismatic and a Nazarene. How many hands do they raise? Do you, did you ever watch Fiddler on the Roof? Don't you love that? Now, this guy, when he's talking to God, his eyes are open, his head is lifted toward heaven, he's going, God, I know that wealth is a curse. Curse me! Curse me! <laughs> don't, don't you see that dialogue? That is exactly the normal position of Jewish prayer. There, this has nothing to do with the modern usage. When Jesus prayed... I get so tickled. I ask people, where, where did you get the idea of bowing your head and closing your eyes? You got it from your mama. You certainly didn't get it from the Bible. This comes from one parable of the Pharisee and the sinner. Right? One parable. And what we do is we pick the first two things he did. If you really want to be biblical, he bowed his head, he closed his eyes, and he beat his breast. I've never seen a church do that. Now, if you want to be biblical next time you pray, just close your eyes and beat your chest. No, no, no. How we pray, the position of our body is not the issue in prayer. I know some people who want to kneel. It is not more spiritual to kneel. I, I used to get tickled at First Baptist Dallas. If you were going to speak there, whenever you prayed, you had to kneel by the pulpit. There was a microphone there. It was so structured, the guys on this side had to cross their legs this way, and the guys on this side had holy spit. How you pray is an intimacy between you and God. Where you pray, how often you pray. I used to get tickled. You know, young people do the ten, the ten steps to spiritual growth, like there really were ten steps to spiritual growth. You got to get up at five o'clock and pray for 45 minutes, or you're not really spiritual. Give me a break. I am not a morning person. Leave me alone. I'll pray when I want to. Thank you. 
So Jesus lifted his hands, lifted his head, opened his eyes and prayed. That's the typical position of Jewish prayer. This is not a proof text for raising your hands in church. Holy moly, how we manipulate this text, our own traditions, or ignore it to our own traditions. Not you, but the Baptists in California. (laughs) One more point. If Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, thought it necessary to pray often, to pray before major decisions, to get away from the others early and pray, how much more do we need to pray? Now, the gospel that records the prayers of Jesus most, it's not Matthew, it's not Mark, it's not John, it's Luke. It's in Luke where Jesus prays so often. But I I think it's a good, can you ever pray too much? No. No. Could you pray too little? Yes. Does it make a difference if you pray once about something versus many times about something? No. Does it make a difference if you pray in Jesus' name versus the Spirit or something? No. Can you pray to the Father only? No. There are prayers to the Son. Usually we say we pray to the Father through the Son uh, by the Spirit. But the truth is we can pray to any person of the Trinity... As often as anything concerns us, and the truth is, the more we pray, the more we're going to live like him. I I really think, I sure like that song, this is a day the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. That's true of every day in this world. But I used to, you know, when I was teaching at the university, I'd get up and I'd say, Lord, I, I want to give you this day. This is the day you've made. After two faculty meetings, I had to pray again by 1030. Because I guarantee you that first prayer was gone. We need through the day. Now, please don't, please don't think you've got to close your eyes when you pray. If you do, please don't drive your car. It's an intimacy with the Father. And the greatest thing about prayer is not that we get what we ask for, but that we've been with the Father. That we recognize his moment-by-moment presence and that we ask his opinion and power on every decision, even the smallest ones. Now, he calls him father. Do you, can you imagine how much the religious leaders hated Jesus calling Yahweh father? Now, there are a couple of implications in the Old Testament Israel is son, the king is son. Um, There is a couple of places where the implication of God as father is there. But you'd just be surprised how rare, how rare God is specifically called father in the Old Testament. Jesus, who did not speak Hebrew publicly, but spoke Aramaic. And the word for Aramaic for father is not as formal as father. It's far more like daddy. It's the word Abba. Now, here is a group of Jewish formalists. And here's this upstart, this Nazarene rabbi, unofficial, calling God daddy. Don't you know that just was salt in the wound? And yet Jesus did it over and over to reflect his intimacy, especially in John, where the whole point is, I'm from above, you're from below. I'm telling you what I heard, you don't understand. So this word father really has some implications. Now, the hour has come. Of course, this word hour is really interesting. Um, Jesus looked just like everybody else. I get so tickled with these, some of these movies where Tab Hunter is Jesus. You know, this blonde-haired guy with blue eyes, holy That is not good typecasting. Jesus did not have blue eyes and he didn't have blonde hair. He is Jewish. (laughs) First century Palestinian. And he looked just like everybody else. He wasn't taller. He wasn't handsomer. He wasn't faster. He wasn't stronger. Matter of fact, several times they tried to kill him and he just moved in the crowd. Looked just like him. Lost in the crowd. People... Somebody said to me, uh, you you, you preach over my head. I said, I can't preach over your head. I'm five foot seven. I used to really do jokes at my church on, on my height. And one time my deacons voted to rename my church to the Munchkin Baptist Church. Thank God it was voted down. But the whole point is, do you realize that men of the first century in Palestine were five foot two? I am taller than Jesus. 
Now, see, we don't think of Jesus that way. He said, my hour has come. Several times during the gospel, it says, my hour has not come. If you look at John, when the Greeks came to Andrew, the Greeks, and said, we want to see Jesus, Jesus says, my hour has come. Now, this is an Old Testament prophetic idiom for the moment. And for, when Jesus used it, it's for the moment of the trial, um, the scourging, the crucifixion, and his death. J John often calls that Jesus is glorified. Isn't that an amazing word to use for the terrible judgment of this, these Jewish and Roman authorities on Jesus? His hour had come. You know the time was here. This is before it happened. He wants these men to know, I am not overcome by circumstances. I know what's going to happen. I allow it for God's purpose. Now, these men need to know that because it, things are about to be taken out of their hand and seemingly out of his hand. But Jesus said, I want to remind you of John 10. Three times Jesus says, I laid down my life. I take it up again. No one takes it from me. This is the will of God. This is the plan of God. He's going to freely give his life. Men, don't be surprised. I'm telling you before it happens so you'll know. That's, what we're, that's what's going on here. Now, in, beginning in verse 2, I want you to look at your Bibles. You talk about another strong statement. I showed you one of these earlier, but here it is again. A little different way, but notice, notice in verse 2 where it says... Even as you gave him authority over all flesh. Ooh. It was Josh McDowell in his first book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. is where he talks about Jesus' claims. Jesus' radical statements about himself. And I think it was Josh McDowell that came up with this statement. The statements of Jesus are so radical, so profound... That he is either a lunatic, a liar, or the incarnate son of God. Now, this is a peasant carpenter, unofficial teacher from Nazareth and says, <laughs> you've given me the authority over all flesh. This is somewhat like the uh, beginning to the Great Commission, which says all authority in heaven on earth has been given to you. Matthew 28, 18. Now, either that's true or the New Testament's a lie. Now, we're about to, the word flesh here means all mankind. You've given me authority over all mankind. The next little phrase, to whom you gave him. You, if you're a Calvinist, you read into this that some were given to Jesus by God the Father and some were not. Now, I first want to say that I certainly believe that the only place to start theology is in the sovereignty of God. It is all focused in him. He initiates it. It is his plan. It's his agenda. It's his covenant. You can't come to him unless the Holy Spirit draws you. There is no place to start a theology without God is in control. Have you read Romans 9 lately? I'm God, sit down and shut up. That's Romans 9. I'll do what I want to, thank you. It's Romans 9. This text, though it may lend itself to that understanding, is not what we're talking about. This is not meant to limit some from trusting Christ. What these texts are meant to do is put a backbone of steel into those who have trusted him when the terrible hours of crucifixion and persecution are about to hit the church. This is not meant to exclude some. This is to encourage those who are already included. You cannot let a text like this trump John 3.16, John 1.12. You can't do it. How easy we build systematic theologies, denominational theologies on selected proof texts that make logical sense to human beings. The gospel is an Eastern paradoxical book, not Western logic. Now, um, <clears throat> I give them eternal life. Now, have, do you notice the distinction in John? Paul talks about, you trust Christ, 
There's a process being saved, and then one day you shall be saved. That's Paul. You, you, you trust him. You, you, you come to know him. You believe. Then you continue to believe. And then one day you stand before him. But that's not John. John says you have eternal life now. Now, this is known by the term realized eschatology. But I think that's an unfortunate term. I think inaugurated kingdom is a better word. Jesus came to inaugurate the kingdom. The kingdom has fully come in Christ, but the kingdom is not consummated yet. The first coming brought the new age, but the second coming confirms, establishes the new age. So we live in the tension of the already you have eternal life and the not yet you don't have a new resurrection body yet. And we live in that terrible tension. So I, I try to put it this way because I want to make this as radical a statement as I can. You've, you've, <laughs> you've grown to know me, I hope. <laughs> I try to get you to think by overstating truths. Everything about heaven except seeing God and being with loved ones is already possible for those who believe. The intimacy of the Garden of Eden, the damaged image, has been fully restored in the salvation in Christ. When you and I pray, we're in the very presence of God. All of the benefits of intimacy and knowing him are ours now by faith. Now think about that. John is the one that emphasizes eternal life now. Now eternal life is not, I don't think it's continuing the same kind of life we have now. It's a new quality. It's a new intimacy. It's what the Garden of Eden was meant to be. It's the purpose of humanity finally fulfilled in creatures made in God's image, having intimate contact with him. Now the problem comes, how do billions of people have intimate contact with Jesus? You know, the problem, when Jesus says, it's better for you that I leave, the whole point is, if I'm, only a, if I'm one person, I can just be in one place at one time. It's better for you that I go. The Holy Spirit comes and I can be everywhere. Well, we've got to be careful of putting that back. If everything in heaven is only physical, how close can you get to Jesus in a billion people? How often do you get to talk to Jesus and there's a billion of us that want to talk to him? See, this is the mystery I cannot solve. This, this is the mystery I don't know how to do it. But I sure like John that says fellowship is restored now. Now, there's a future thing. I know there is. But, friends, you need to know. I heard somebody define a good preaching as telling believers what they already are in Christ. I like that. You need to know who you are. Remember when my kids were going dating, I would say to them, remember who you are. Remember who you are. Well, I want to say to you, remember who you are. You're the kings. You belong to the king. You're part of the king's family. Your name, his name is tattooed on your forehead wherever you go and how you act. And we have it now. It's not a coming, it's a now. Okay. Um, in, in verse 3, there's, we kind of develop this eternal life thing, but I want to pick up on two aspects of this. Number one, the only true God. Now this, if you will look at verse 3, this is not a Jesus is deity text. Now follow with me. Verse 3 is not... A Jesus is deity text. This is a monotheistic text. There is one true God. And Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Now, this is a text that makes a distinction between the Father and the Son. Now there are texts that make a distinction. And there are texts that make them one. Now which one's true? Yes. I, I, in no way do I want to say Jesus is not deity. I, I believe he is. But this text is saying there's one true God. Now, I don't know if I can, I don't know how to, to intensify this issue. We are monotheist. We affirm with Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. 
We are not tritheist. We are not polytheist. We are monotheist. But, and it's a big but, if Jesus is divine and the Holy Spirit is a person, we have got a huge footnote on monotheism. Now, I don't know how to put that together. You would think that these early Jews who trusted Christ, Paul, particularly a trained rabbi, would help us understand how the deity of Jesus does not violate monotheism. Yet he never does. But over and over, he puts the three persons of the Trinity active in different contexts together without going into it. It's a practical monotheism instead of a philosophical monotheism. I wish I, I, wish I could deal with that more. It, it's just hard to do. It's just not easy. Um, I wanted to mention this word true for a minute. The only true God. Now, you know, th- these are Hebrew thinkers, Aramaic speakers, writing in street Greek. I want to say that again. The writers of the New Testament are Hebrew thinkers, Aramaic speakers, writing in second language, language of commerce, street Greek. So you have to ask yourself, what do these words mean? Do they mean what they mean in other Greek writings? Or do these words mean what they mean in the Greek translation of the Old Testament? I would submit to you the place to find these meanings is in how does the Septuagint use these words. Instead of the true, one true God, the Hebrew understanding would be one faithful God. One trustworthy God. That's what the word, that's the implication of the word true or truth in Hebrew. It's the Greek concept of truth versus error. Now I think this is certainly an overlap. How often does John take a word like logos in John 1.1 that has a Hebrew background and a Greek background and purposefully use it in both ways? So is Jesus the tr- is God the trustworthy God or the true God? And the answer is yes. It's this double meaning in John. And uh, if you have my notes, I've done a whole thing on the different uses of the word true in John's writing. And just real quickly, I want to show you this. The Father is true or trustworthy. His ways are true. His judgments are true. God's sayings are true. Those are all, and then the texts are in here. This is how it's used about the Son. The Son is true light. The Son is the true vine. The Son is true, full of grace and truth. He is truth, John 14, 6. He is true, Revelation 3 and 19. And the Son's testimony is true. Now, do you see how we're using this? You can trust what God says. You can trust what Jesus says. This this is really, in a roundabout way, an emphasis on inspiration. Jesus fully reveals the Father, and the New Testament fully captures that revelation. That's what we're talking about. Um, And notice again, Jesus Christ, whom you you have sent, how often in John. uh, Do you think Jesus said, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent? Would you say that talking about yourself? This is probably an editorial comment from John, the Apostle John. Reminding us how many times Jesus said, the Father sent me. And as the Father sent him, what does he do to you? So send I you. Same word. Now, verse 4, I've glorified you on earth. Now, the word glory, what is a killer word to define? Again, I think it has a Hebrew background. This is the word kabod. This is the, it really meant heavy scales. You put weights on this and so much grain on this. It came to be used not only for that which is heavy as that which is valuable, but it came to have the idea of this this powerful cloud of the wilderness wandering where where God's presence was veiled so nobody could see him and die. It it began to have a quality of light or bright or shining. So it has the idea of of value and brilliance. And uh, sometimes it's used for God the Father and sometimes it's used for Jesus the Son. Uh, it's really a hard word to, to capture. But um, how did Jesus glorify the Father? Well, he revealed the Father. How did he reveal the Father? What he said, what he did, 
and who he was. So I want to come back. What are the purposes of Jesus' incarnation? Number one, to fully and completely reveal the unseen God. Two, to pay a price he did not owe because human beings could not pay the price. And number three, to give us an example of how we should live. To show us what mankind was meant to be, could have been, and one day will be in fellowship with God. Now, there are three purposes from the coming, and all of those are connected with glorifying the Father. Um, Now, verse 5, I I want you to read verse 5 in your translation. I think verse 5 does emphasize what I would call pre-existent deity. Um, We sing a, a hymn at Christmas called, Lord at His Birth. Now, Jesus didn't become Lord because he lived an obedient life. Uh, uh, Lordship was not given him after he was crucified because he obeyed God. He was the king that left the glories of heaven to come as a peasant. He's always been God. And uh, try to list some of these verses. I, I know you can't write them all down, but I want you to hear the weight of these number of verses that I think emphasize the deity of Jesus, which is the problem we face trying to deal with Islam and Judaism because they think this violates monotheism. But, but if you want to listen to these, I hope you'll get them after. But just listen to the weight of this. John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.15, 1, John 6.62, John 8.58, John 16.28, John 17.11, John 17, 13, John 17, 24, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, Philippians 2, 6 through 11, Colossians 1, 17, Hebrews 1, 3, Hebrews 10, 5 through 8. Now, friends, that is a bunch of text from a lot of different folks that seem to clearly reveal the truth of the, of the preexistence of Jesus. I'd put it this way. There has never been a time when Jesus did not exist. It's never been a time. Now, that that messes up monotheism. But if you believe the New Testament is true, you you can't get away from it. Pre-existent deity is what we've got to be willing to die for. (laughs) Now, this is not a fight over where where pants to church or (laughs) spit dance or chew. Pre-existent deity is one of those biggies. I mean, this is who is he. And uh, this is where that text in 1 John... 4, 1 through 3. He is fully God and he is fully man. Amen? And if you don't believe that, you are of the antichrist spirit, which is targeting Gnosticism, which would affirm his deity but deny his humanity. Now, can I explain all that? Absolutely not. But I believe the New Testament is the trustworthy, revealed, only clear self-revelation of the one true God. I'm willing to die for New Testament revelation, period. It has nothing to do with my opinion. Now, do I misinterpret it? Sure. Do you misinterpret it? Sure. It's not my interpretation that's true. It's scripture that's true. We've got to hold on to that. Well, I've got just a few minutes. I'd be happy to talk to you about something I've said or chase a rabbit that we implied. Okay. Well, next Sunday night, we're gonna, I'm going to do uh, verses uh, 6 through 19. Would you read 6 through 19 for next Sunday night? And I will have this box down front uh, for you to put your questions in. Just take a 3 by 5 card or bring one, put it in the box, and, and I promise you I'll deal with them fairly. And the good thing about an interim kind of doing that, <laughs> I'll tell you what I really think. And then try to give you the books and the scripture references to back it up so you can check me, okay? We're not looking for us to all agree, we're looking for us to to have a dialogue about some of these controversial questions. Uh, My view is that professor, pastors want to keep everybody together and everybody loving one another. Those are pastors. I'm not a pastor. I'm a professor. I want to get these worms on the table. Now, I can't answer all these questions. I'm smart enough to know I can't answer, but I'm willing to talk to you about the questions. Amen? Amen. I'm willing to share with you a 40-year Bible teacher's opinion, give you the freedom to check me, disagree. I just want to stimulate you 
to look at the scripture, not to just a tradition. That's where we're coming from. Well, Lord, thank you for getting together tonight. We thank you for all aspects of worship. We thank you you've met with us. We thank you that not only do you meet with us here, but you meet with us throughout the week, moment by moment. We just pray, Lord, that our lives, our emphasis will help people know that we've been with you. I thank you for these who are willing to look at the Bible and think through what they believe and why. I pray that we would understand more so that we could be more like you. Lord, please protect us from the world, from the evil one, and God help us from ourselves. And we pray that as we know more about you, that we'd be able to emulate that moment by moment. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for loving us when we were unlovable. And thank you now for this precious intimacy that we have.